Hi, good evening. Um, people who are like, I started to think about um, I'm so tired. I'm struggling to form sentences. So I'm going to read um, a short story that I really like called The Uncle by Kathleen Collins. Um, I had an uncle who cried himself to sleep. Yes, it's quite a true story and it ended badly. That is to say, one night he cried himself to death. He was close to 40, a former athlete of Olympic stature. In my father's house, there are still gold trophies received while he was in England for the Olympics of some year. He was quite handsome, Negro, but a real double for Marlon Brando. A story runs through my family that one day on the street in Philadelphia, my uncle and Marlon Brando passed each other and stopped each stunned by the resemblance. He was quite fair anyway, a light brown, but with the same brooding Brando-esque face, the pouty jowl around the cheeks and mouth, the disappointed eyes, moody and restless. He was my favorite uncle. It is, separate, it is difficult to separate the story from the slight props of race necessary to bolster it up. I have said he was Negro, a track star of some standing, a devil for Marlon Brando. He had, too, an exquisite wife of such mixed breeding that his skin was the palest white imaginable, hair black and silky, her features keen. As children, my sister and I idolized them, to have such a stunning aunt and uncle, and they loved us too. We spent many summers in the small southern New Jersey town where they lived, in the house that once belonged to my grandmother and now belonged to them. They were always quite broke. I remember once my sister and I turned over the last of our pennies to pay the electric bill, while a worker stood in the doorway ready to cut it off but that only added to their magic in our eyes. To be broke, but still so handsome and beautiful, lazy and generous. For my uncle could no longer run because of the severe asthma attacks that had just begun. And already he had the habit of reclining for days at a time on the living room couch and never moving. My aunt never worked. It seems that I can recall stretches of days when my sister and I would wake up go into their bedroom, and the four of us would lie there for hours, laughing and hearing stories. My aunt loved to talk about sex. Without her, I still might not know its place in the full scheme of procreation. And my uncle loved to order huge submarine sandwiches, hot chocolate, powdered donuts, and ice cream from the luncheonette around the corner, and lie in bed eating and talking. When I take the hallowed filter away from those snug summer days, I see now that already he had lost the will to struggle with life, and that my aunt was a lazy, spoiled woman who thought her fair, almost white skin would save her. I lost touch with my family early, went abroad for several years, came back married and began a family of my own. But my father's letters told of my uncle's slow disintegration, his off-again, on-again jobs as a track coach at various co colleges and recreation centers, his long paralytic bouts of depression when he took to his bed for weeks at a time and cried day and night. I saw him only once during those years, at my parents' summer home where I came to spend a few weeks after the birth of my first child. He came in the front door as I, I was coming down the steps. He looked the same to me, except the brooding Brandle looks had deepened. The sad pout now creased his forehead and beneath his eyes and made his mouth droop 
a little more. But I was fascinated by this deepening, perhaps because I was still young enough to be attracted to sorrow. Then a strange thing happened. In the middle of the night, he woke me up, shook me awake with his violent crying and sobbing, and begged me to come downstairs and talk with him. I did. We sat up the rest of the night and he cried with only slight coherent moments in between. When he would mumble about my aunt, how she had turned out to be stupid, lazy, no real help to him. How he had never amounted to anything, never been able to count on anyone. Oh, how he would cry, give in to his crying, allow it full possession of his being as if life were a vast well of tears, and one must cry to be at the center of it. My father came down, awakened by us, angry and furious at his brother for putting me through such an ordeal. I never saw him again. I never saw him again. But I was having dinner with my parents when the phone call came that told of his death. My father was badly shaken. It was the first of his seven brothers and sisters to die. Yet he was the baby, the last born, the one whom all the others had loved and pampered and spoiled the most. I offered to drive down with my father to his house. On the way, my father filled me in on the last years of his life, the years when he never left the bed, how night after night he kept everyone awake. For somehow in those years, he had managed to produce three now almost grown children with his laments, his great heart-rending sobbing that went on hour after relentless hour until the morning when he would fall asleep and sleep the day away. Only to awaken again at night and begin this vigilant lamentation. His children had grown up inside the sorrow. His brothers and sisters would come time and time again and try to coax him back into life, stand at the bottom of the steps and beg him to come as far as the living room bring succulent meals and plead with him to come down and share them, promise to find him work as the head track coach at some prestigious university. But he kept to his bed, his his mournful inverted existence, cried in his pillow until death took him away. My aunt opened the door. With the years she'd kept all her beauty except around the eyes the washed out eyes of a woman who has put up with too much. The house was much as I remembered it. The living room couch where I would watch him stretch out his huge submarine sandwiches and powdered donuts. The dining room which now held only near white women. Older variations of my aunt sitting together, sipping sherry and whispering. I went upstairs to his bedroom the wild old fashioned bed where he'd lived dominated the room. Stood there like a monument to his perverse pursuit of humiliation and sorrow. It was surely perverse, surely bound to the color of his skin and its bastard possibilities. But his weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth brimmed potent to overflowing in the room. And I began to weep for him weep tears of pride and joy that that he should have so soaked his life, that he should have so soaked his life in sorrow and gone back to some ancient ritual beyond the blunt humiliation of his skin with its bound and sealed possibilities, so refused to overcome his sorrow as some affliction to be transcended, some stumbling block put in his way for the sake of trial and endurance so refused to strike out against it, go down in a blaze of responsibilities, met 
and struggled with. No, he utterly honored his sorrow, gave into it with such deep and boundless weeping that it seemed as I stood there, he was the bravest man I had ever known. Ooh, Lord Jesus, it's a fire. Okay, uh, this is from What Happened to Interracial Love by Kathleen Collins. Um, that story was written in... I have no idea. I, that's a story I read a few months ago, and I still think it's one of the most beautiful stories I've ever read. Um, thank you for watching. Um, bye.